Sweden was famously neutral for both world wars, but what would change if they joined the Allies in the Second World War? Would this prevent the fall of Norway and maybe the half of Denmark, with the Swedish perhaps helping out Finland against the Soviet Union? How can these events change world history? Let me show you what I came up with. Let me tell you what happened in Sweden in between the two world wars, also known as the interwar period. This is important as it gives you the best possible point of divergence for Sweden joining the Allies. An interesting fact is that the Kingdom of Sweden was the first country in the world to deal with the Great Depression caused by irresponsible Americans in the late 1920s. Thanks to the Social Democrats, led by Per Albin Hansen, and their economic reforms, Sweden became a country in which everyone wished to live in during the Great Depression. The standard of living there was high and did not suffer much. Real incomes even rose during the crisis. Among other things, Sweden was held by German orders for iron ore at a time when the German Chancellor began to prepare for war. Politically, however, there was a disunity in Sweden. Per Albin Hansson ruled from 1932 to 1936, and after 100 days of Axel Persson Bramstorp's rule, he returned as Prime Minister, ruling from autumn 1936 until his death 10 years later. During his reign, the kingdom was neutral, however, it became a refuge for the Jewish community fleeing German persecution. In part, the country financially and materially helped the Finns against the Soviets, at the turn of 1939-1940. This means that if we want Sweden not to remain neutral, we need to get rid of Per Albin Hansson and replace him with somebody else. Historically, just before the fall of the German Reich, Sweden planned to join the Allies in order to help liberate neighboring Norway and Denmark. The country hesitated for too long, so nobody took this act. But what would it look like if the charismatic Gosta Bage was elected as the new Prime Minister in the spring of 1936? Unlike Axel Persson Bramstorp, would he be able to assemble a government majority that would hold it together for more than 100 days? That possibility would have been here if he appealed correctly just before the elections. As a strongly conservative person, much like Winston Churchill, he had a relatively stable voter base among religious people, who made up the vast majority of the population. There was a relatively high chance for victory for Gosta Bage had he been much more active in propaganda and appealing to the Protestant bastion of Northern Europe. In the event of Gosta Bage's victory and his subsequent successful formation of a government majority, it would mean a major turnaround in Swedish foreign affairs. The export of iron ore to the German Reich would immediately begin to be rapidly curtailed. At the same time, so that Swedish miners and workers in smelters do not lose their jobs, iron ore and steel begin to be exported to these countries that would be attacked by Germany in the future. German production of tanks, cannons, aircrafts and warships is thus noticeably limited. Germany is forced to buy iron ore from other countries, but often at a higher price. On the contrary, in Poland, Czechoslovakia and France, all these weapons are produced in larger quantities. Meanwhile, Sweden is trying to maintain a high standard of living for its citizens, but at the same time it is starting to invest heavily into rearmament. There is a secret cooperation with Great Britain, from which the Swedish arms factories purchase a license to manufacture British warships, mainly submarines, then with France, from which they purchase a license to manufacture French aircraft, mainly bombers, and then Czechoslovakia, from which they purchase a license to manufacture tanks. The German economy, which is in a much worse state as a result of wild rearmament and the purchase of expensive raw materials from other countries, results in the German Chancellor being forced to carry out the Anschluss already in the fall of 1937. The annexation of Austria partially happened when it did historically when Germany was running out of money due to constant rearmament, so Austrian gold subsidized the German economy for a few months. This annexation of an independent country is a big shock for most European countries, but nobody wants to do anything about it. Only Sweden and Czechoslovakia, whose Czech part is now surrounded by Germans on all three sides, protest diplomatically. Let us also not forget about Mexico. Germany on the other hand is temporarily saved thanks to Austrian gold and oil, a small amount of which can be mined in the Austrian Alps. The German Chancellor and the Hungarian regent Mikolaj Horthy begin to cooperate strongly economically. Aluminum is exported in large quantities from the Kingdom of Hungary to the German Reich. Italy initially dislikes German expansion to the south, however, when Germany promises Mussolini future rights to the Balkan Peninsula, relations are quickly normalized. Most of the following events take place a month or two earlier than when they actually were. The German minority in the Czech Sudetenland is radicalized much earlier, which leads to rebellions organized by illegal German terrorist organization Freikorps. The Munich Agreement will take place on the 30th of July 1938. This time, the Swedish Prime Minister Gosta Bage took part in the conference 
who does not agree with the annexation of Czech borderlands to the German Reich. However, since the German Chancellor, the Italian Duce, Naval Chamberlain and the French President Edouard Daudier agreed to the annexation of the Sudetenland by Germany, it was four against one. Despite the fact that Czechoslovakia has many more tanks and warplanes, while the German army is not as good as it was, the cowardly Czechoslovak President Edward Beneš gives in to the German demands under pressure from the European powers. This time, in addition to Romania and Yugoslavia, Czechoslovakia was also supported by Sweden, from which at the beginning of August offered refuge to Czechoslovak Jews in the event that the rest of Czechoslovakia was occupied by the German army in the future. Tens of thousands of Jewish residents and hundreds of thousands of Sudeten Czechs flee through Poland to Sweden. In addition to residents, Czech arms factories are moving to Sweden as well, which until then produced tanks, fighters and bombers for the Czechoslovak army. From the end of summer to the beginning of winter, the arms companies ČKD, Škoda, Avia and Aero are successfully moved to the Kingdom of Sweden. When the company Tatra and Letrov decide to leave Czechoslovakia at the end of December, Germany decides to occupy the rest of Czechoslovakia without warning. The Allies respond to this with a diplomatic protest, but do not intervene in this action. Since the meeting of the Slovak ultranationalist politician Joseph Tiso and the German Chancellor did not take place the day before, the whole of Slovakia is handed over to the Kingdom of Hungary. Meanwhile, Bohemia and Moravia would become protectorates as a puppet state of the German Reich. Czechoslovakia ceases to exist in yet another alternate history scenario. Thanks to Swedish convoys, part of the Czechoslovak army, including soldiers, pilots, as well as equipment, including tanks and aircraft, was transported across the Baltic Sea to Sweden. Thanks to Czechoslovak Jews, who are excellent traders and entrepreneurs, they were able to keep the Swedish economy afloat, as constant rearmament led the Swedish economy to the brink of state bankruptcy, similar to that of Germany. Czechoslovak arms companies, including those mentioned, which within a few months built new factories for the production of tanks and warplanes, subsequently begin to produce large quantities of all these weapons for the Swedish army. Czechoslovak soldiers and pilots trained the Swedish recruits on a large scale, thanks to which the Swedish army began to become a new force on the European continent. Since the second half of 1939, the Swedish army has been trying to convince the Polish one to mobilize as soon as possible, since Germany will most likely conquer Poland in order to unite East Prussia with the Reich. However, Germany itself must devote more time to the eventual invasion, despite the fact that most of these events took place ahead of time. Thanks to the fact that most Czechoslovak arms companies moved from Central Europe to North Europe, Germany is more dependent on their domestic armaments. The subsequent Molotov Ribbentrop Pact is signed at the end of October, so the German invasion of Poland is scheduled for the 1st of November 1939. The Wehrmacht, supported by the Luftwaffe, enters Polish territory at 6 am, since in November it always begins to dawn at a quarter to 7. The Poles, who were much better prepared for war thanks to the import of Swedish iron ore and a greater amount of military equipment, resist the German invasion much longer than they actually did. Within two weeks, the Germans were able to occupy only Gdansk, Poznan and Katowice provinces. As Slovakia would in this alternate history become part of the Kingdom of Hungary, which was not yet in the Axis, so the German army could not attack Polish troops from the south. All of this would change on the 17th of November, with the entry of the Soviet Union into the conflict. However, the Poles initially gave both aggressors a hard time. The thing is that the Red Army is much more successful, which is reflected in a successful occupation of all of Eastern Poland at the end of the same month. However, the Polish nation cannot resist for a long time when it is at war on two fronts. At the beginning of December, the Soviets launched a major offensive with the aim to conquer all of Galicia. Already on the 30th of November, there was a forced modification of the Molotov Ribbentrop Pact, in which the Soviet Union can also claim Galicia, if it gets it earlier than the German Reich. In the second half of December, the Red Army fights for Krakow after a bloody battle with the Galician hilly terrain, Warsaw is captured by the German army at the end of the month. The capitulation is signed on the 1st of January 1940, with the remnants of the Polish army concentrated at the border of Slovakia, would flee through Hungary, Yugoslavia and into the Mediterranean Sea to France. Now, you may wonder why am I saying this, because Poles and Hungarians have always been friends. This thousand-year-old brotherhood was even manifested in our history during the German and Soviet invasion of Poland, when the Hungarians refused to enter the war. Since Galicia fell to the Soviet Union in this timeline, Mikuláš Horty is in a much more difficult position. The German army is not as breathtaking as in our history, and if the German Reich eventually invaded the USSR, Germany would most likely lose this war even harder. Thus, the Hungarian region will keep the entry into the Axis as a back option. Instead of claiming Hungarian inhabited territories in Romania and Yugoslavia, 
he will try to create something like a Balkan curtain against Bolshevism, which will join the Axis in the event of defeat of France and Britain. Even Mussolini is unsure if it's a good idea to join the Axis. Despite the successful occupation of Austria and Czechoslovakia, the German Reich did not prove itself as an invisible titan during the campaign to Poland. It is even possible that without the Soviet Union, Germany would never have been able to conquer the entire Polish territory. Now, however, it is necessary to look at the northeast of Europe, where the not so famous invasion of Finland would take place. This time, the Czechoslovak army, consisting of millions of men, who successfully fought the Bolsheviks 20 years ago along the entire Trans Siberian Railroad, is now participating in this act. Finland finds itself in the same position as Czechoslovakia was in our timeline at the Munich Agreement, when the vast majority of the European powers decided to leave the prey to the predator. Czechoslovaks, who know very well what it is like to be betrayed and left to their fate, and who could not defend their beloved homeland, decide to move to Finland, where they will face the ultimate enemy. Thus, the Winter War will not become a quick victory for the Soviet Union, but a national disaster. Stalin's biggest mistake was to attack Finland just after the defeat of Poland. After the bleeding of the Red Army in Finnish Karelia, the Czechoslovak army launched a massive offensive on the Kola Peninsula, with the aim to conquer Murmansk. They succeed in doing this during January, with the Soviets losing around 100,000 men, while the Czechoslovaks lost only 25,000. During the following month, Czechoslovak infantry, together with Finnish cavalry, occupied the entire Kola Peninsula. Sweden also bolsters Finland's economy, even sending many more volunteers, as to help their Nordic brother. At the beginning of March, the whole of Soviet Karelia is conquered as well, which forces Stalin to reconsider his plans. On the 31st of March, the Moscow Treaty is signed, in which the Soviets would acquire Finnish Karelia, but at the cost of the Kola Peninsula and Soviet Karelia. The Soviets thus gained full control of Lake Ladoga, but Lake Onega is divided between the two states, with the Finns taking full control of Lake Vigo Zero. In April, the Czechoslovak Legion returns to Sweden, which in the meantime is preparing for a defense of Norway and Denmark. The German Navy is in a much smaller state at the time, but still poses a danger to both kingdoms, since Operation Vesterunbung will not take place until May, due to a greater lack of raw materials. The British will have time to mine the entire Norwegian coast as part of Operation Wildfred. Germany would thus succeed in defeating Denmark in just one day, but as a result of previously mentioned preventative mining and mainly the declaration of war on the German Reich by the Kingdom of Sweden, Operation Vesterunbung will never succeed. The Swedish fleet of new submarines and destroyers sinks the German cruisers, while the German battleships are damaged by the twin-engine Potets 540 bombers, which would have been licensed in Sweden since the second half of the 1930s, accompanied by the new monoplane Czechoslovak Avia B-35 fighters, which were already made in Sweden by Czechoslovak designers. This is used by the British Navy under the command of Winston Churchill to succeed this time and destroys most of the German Navy during June. A desperate German Chancellor, worrying for his position, decides to invade the Benelux. He eventually succeeds in this, but because the crippled Luftwaffe, it is not possible to effectively support the German tanks, which, although they managed to get through the Ardennes forest, could not get any further. In July, the Swiss, together with the Czechoslovak army, landed the Jutland Peninsula, thus beginning the liberation of the Kingdom of Denmark. Meanwhile, the French army manages to come up with a plan to push the Wehrmacht out of northern France. As the French army is still larger than the German army, the Wehrmacht is pushed into Belgium in early August. In desperation, Germany asked the Italian Duchess to join the war, however, he has been hesitating for several weeks. Although the Italian army succeeded in conquering Ethiopia, the army itself is not yet prepared for war with France and the United Kingdom. Moreover, now that Operation Vesirumbung has failed, and now that the German army is gradually being pushed out of the Benelux too, it might be better to switch sides. In August, the entire of the Benelux is liberated by the French and British armies. Denmark would also have been cleansed of the German ultranationalists at the same time. Stalin, who would be watching the entire conflict unfold in the meantime, would begin to consider an intervention that would allow for him to gain the rest of Poland and possibly East Prussia. When Italy decided to withdraw from the Axis, it was clear that Germany would be defeated sooner or later. The French, together with the British, entered the Rhineland while the Swedes, together with the Czechoslovaks, pushed the Wehrmacht towards Hamburg. Between the 7th and the 8th of September, a conference takes place in Stockholm in which Gosta Bagge, French Prime Minister Paul Reynaud, the new British Prime Minister Winston Churchill, the Italian Duce and Joseph Stalin want to draw new borders and sphere of influence in Europe. After the subsequent defeat of Germany, the entire Austrian Tyrol would be annexed into the Kingdom of Italy. All German territories west of the Rhine River would be annexed into France. The whole of Schleswig-Holstein will forever be controlled by the Kingdom of Denmark. 
Норд померения, пас ново на Суидиш померения, уж би онкото да Суидиш е пантилда на Полионик Лорс, would become part of Sweden again. The Danubian Confederation would be formed from Austria, Bavaria, Baden, Hohenzollern and Württemberg, with its center being in Munich. The Second Weimar Republic, with its center in Berlin, is to be formed from the Lutherian parts of Germany. However, the restoration of the Czechoslovak Republic is much more complicated, since all of Slovakia and Carpathia and Rutinia were occupied by Hungary in the peacetime, and since the Hungarians remained neutral during this war, it is understandable that Horty would not want to just give up these territories. While Gustav Bage and Winston Churchill insisted on the restoration of the Czechoslovak state, Paul Reynold and the Italian Duce would rather have Greater Hungary in Central Europe as a bulwark against Bolshevism. Even the restoration of interwar Poland is not without its problems. Stalin insists on keeping southern and eastern Poland at all costs. However, he was willing to give up the German-occupied parts of Poland, centered in Warsaw, on the condition that the Allies would allow the Red Army to annex Lithuania, Latvia and Estonia. The Allies thus faced a very difficult decision. Either they would have to sacrifice the Poles or the Czechoslovaks. Since the United Kingdom and France declared war on Germany in order to help Poland, representatives of the Western powers decided to restore Poland. Although Galicia, Western Ukraine, Western Belarus and Bialystok province would remain part of the Soviet Union. The only thing that Stalin is willing to give back to the Poles is the city of Krakow and its surroundings north of the Vistula River at the coast of East Prussia. The Allies know that Stalin is trying to put as much pressure on them as possible, but there was no other option. At 10 o'clock in the evening, the agreement on the post-war arrangement of Central Europe is finally signed. The following day, on the 9th of September, Mikulaj Horty is invited to the Swedish capital. In the afternoon of the same day, representatives of the Allies tried to persuade the Hungarian regent to cooperate. In the end, he was willing to accept the restoration of the Czechoslovak state, but not within the pre-Munich borders. Horty is finally willing to give up most of Slovakia, but Carpathian Rutinia and southern Slovakia will remain part of the Kingdom of Hungary. At the same time, the Hungarian regent insists on the annexation of Austria and Burgenland. In the end, the Allies agree to this. On the 19th of September, Italy, Hungary and the Soviet Union declare war on the German Reich. At the end of the month, the Germans surrender, while the German Chancellor and most of his loyal commanders commit suicide. On October of the same year, Europe is organized as agreed to upon in Stockholm. As compensation for Czechoslovakia, they receive German lower and upper Lusatia, which were inhabited by Lusatian Sorbs, whose language was very similar to Czech. Although 300 years of Germanization, this Polabian Slavic nation can once again speak its mother language. Lusatian Sorbian would become one of the official languages in the restored Czechoslovakia. In 1941, the Soviet Union is preparing for a war with Japan. Thanks to the triumphant border skirmishes, the leadership of the Red Army was confident that Japan was not invincible. On the 7th of December, Stalin declares war on Emperor Hirohito. Two years later, most of China is once again in the hands of the Kuomintang, led by Chiang Kai-shek. Korea and the Japanese islands are occupied by the Red Army after a long and bloody guerrilla warfare. Since the second half of the 1940s, the Cold War begins between the Comintern, which is the Soviet Union, Mongolia, Manchuria, Korea and Japan, and the Allies, consisting of Britain, France, Italy, the Danube Confederation, Hungary, Czechoslovakia, the Second Weimar Republic, Poland, Sweden, Finland and Nationalist China. The United States of America would remain neutral, although it is materially supported by Chiang Kai-shek during the 1940s, which prevented Mao Zedong from ever coming to power. However, the Kingdom of Sweden once again would become one of the great powers of Europe, which greatly influenced the character of the Nordic people. Gustav Bage, who ruled the Kingdom of Sweden as Prime Minister until his death in 1951, steered the Swedish nation into the opposite direction than Per Albin Hansen did. A nation whose souls in our history embrace liberal, secular and libertarian ideas becomes one of the most vocal fighters against communism and socialism in this timeline, much like the United States under Ronald Reagan. Thanks to Gustav Bage and his Horgan party, which ruled for most of the second half of the 20th century, Sweden has become one of the most patriotic nations that has retained its religiosity to the same extent. Although the standard of living is not that high, the country has zero crime thanks to a loyal and strong military. As for Eastern Europe, after the collapse of the Soviet Union, which this time happened a few years later due to the fact that the country was not destroyed by ultra-nationalist Germany, the southern and eastern parts of interwar Poland joined the Third Polish Republic. Subsequently, the independent East Prussia decided to join the Second Weimar Republic, resulting in these borders. The Second World War never became the massive conflict as it was in our timeline, due to Germany being defeated sooner. The Germans also didn't secure any allies in this conflict, resulting in their quick defeat. 
was what would happen if Germany had annexed Austria earlier, for example in 1934. Would this increase in population make Germany stronger in the long term, with them maybe even succeeding to win the Second World War? Check this video out to see what I came up with. See you there!